So unlike the principles in this book, The Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham, we're not going to be talking about the value investing that is most famously employed by Warren Buffett today. Instead, we're going to be talking about how most analysts would go about comparing different management funds and looking at the returns and looking at a risk weighted metric of those returns. So what most analysts might do is jump straight to the Sharpe ratio. Now, this is what we want to talk about today. What are the biggest assumptions behind this point value estimate of the Sharpe ratio and what are the downfalls? So let's jump into it. For the purpose of this video, we're just gonna focus on a very specific example. If I have a number of portfolios that I need to choose between, why should I not be just jumping straight to the Sharpe ratio? Well, let's look at the example where we have only 12 portfolio managers that we're trying to assess. Here I'm just assigning their mean standard deviations and the skew in their portfolio distributions randomly. Now, I'm also randomly assigning the number of years that these portfolios have been in existence for, and therefore how many years worth of data we have to actually judge our analysis from. This is important because obviously, for some portfolios, they've only started last year, or some have been in existence for 30 years. So this impacts our assessment. So let's take a quick look at our histogram that I've just plotted. I'm taking um, the distributions with skew, standard deviations, mean, and I'm just simulating what it would look like for a number of years. So this is just one outcome. So here's a comparison of our portfolio manager's returns over the last, say, 23 years for manager one, uh, this is manager zero, manager one has seven years, manager two, 28 years of portfolio returns. And this is the data that we get presented with. We get one actual realization over a number of years of what that portfolio fund has done. So this is real world data, quote unquote, real world data that we've just simulated based on the true distributions. So based on this real world data from all our managers that have been operating for a different number of years, how can we deduce what their true strategy Sharpe ratio is? Well, you might go, Jonathan, that's really easy to come up with. What we can do is we can use the central limit theorem, assume the central limit theorem and use it to infer the Sharpe ratios. Now, most people might not know that they're assuming the central limit theorem and this is half of the problem. So the aim is we'd like to compare the Sharpe ratio between a number of different investment managers. How do we do it? Well, essentially, here's the estimate of the Sharpe ratio. We have the expectation of our returns minus the risk free rate, and then that's normalized by our volatility of the asset that we're analyzing. So therefore, we can just do the simple thing, which is take the means and the standard deviations, assume a risk free rate of 4%. Before you go crazy in the comments, Let's just remember that this video is supposed to last the trajectory of time. So risk-free rate, we're just assuming to be 4%. We're looking and considering this as a opportunity cost or as a hurdle rate. So therefore, we're calculating our Sharpe ratios for each of the managers using our mean and standard deviation as per this formula. So now we get our data frame and we can see here we've got the mean, standard deviation and the sharp ratio. And here we've just ordered it based on the sharp ratio. Now remember that we are taking into consideration that risk-free rate. So that's why we've got more negatives here than the mean have negatives here. So if we just list them from least to best, what you would say is probably, oh, let's just invest all our money with this portfolio manager. But is that the right thing to do? Well, the problem is that this is just one value. And currently I have no idea about my uncertainty in that estimate. So let's try and dig a little bit deeper and understand more about what we're assuming when we just blindly take this formula and, uh, and compute the mean and the standard deviations in order to compute a one value Sharpe ratio. So the biggest assumption and the most important one we're estimating is using the maximum likelihood estimation from the normal distribution. So this assumes the property of the central limit theorem that as our data goes to infinity, we then get a normal distribution. So we're going to explain how that works now. So what is the central limit theorem? 
Well, essentially, the central limit theorem, if you take any sum of random variables that are independently and identically distributed to IID with a finite variance, regardless of the distribution, as the number of random variables as you are summing approaches infinity, the scaled summation, so normalized for the mean drift and the variance as you start adding up these variables, converges to the normal distribution. So my favorite video that explains this better than anyone else could is on the three blue, one brown uh, YouTube channel, and I recommend giving it a watch. Essentially, they've got a really nice animation there where you, they show as you start adding up for an uneven die, as you start adding up these values and running the experiment again and again and again and again, the histogram starts uh, converging towards a normal distribution. I think it's a fascinating animation. Go watch the video. So let's use an example that actually cements this principle in our head of the central limit theorem. So we have one investment manager now, and we're just going to define his actual returns distribution. So let's say that his actual distribution with the team that he's got and the strategies that he has year after year, it's invariant, it doesn't change. That would be a long, uh, long ask, but let's say that it didn't change. So it's time invariant. We have a mean of 8%, a standard deviation of 15%, and a minus one as a skew. Now let's just sample, just for the sake of visualization of the distribution, 1 million points from this distribution, and I'm just returning here the distribution. As you can see from this distribution, we have um, quite a large skew to the right-hand side with that really fat tail to the left-hand side with that downside risk present. So. In, un in order to understand how this would look if we invested with this portfolio management um, year after year, let's run a regular Monte Carlo experiment. So a picture that I'm 25 years old and I would like to invest my money for the next 25 year period. So I want to be able to take my money out when I'm 50 years old. Let's say that we choose this portfolio manager with this distribution. So we want to investigate the portfolio characteristics, why? Now, specifically, we would like to say something about the expectation of what we could expect our portfolio returns to be in 25 years. So here, by using Monte Carlo, we can essentially get the sample distribution of the mean, which is essentially just the average of all these simulations that we're about to run. Now, we're interested in saying something about these, um, the mean and the variance. And because of this, we can rely on the central limit theorem, which essentially says that once um, we take this sample mean over a large period of time periods, as n goes to infinity, this then converges in distribution to the normal distribution centered around the mean and then this scaled variance metric. So we have an empirical variance, which is estimated like this, and we have a standard error. And the error is around the fact that we're only taking um, an average of randomly generated samples when we're doing Monte Carlo simulation. So therefore the calculation is itself random. And therefore the measure that exists around this error is a standard um, error, and it's denoted by um, this equation here. So we take the standard deviation that we get from our actual simulations, and then essentially we divide that and normalize it by the square root of the number of simulations. So how do we do that? Let's define the holding period in Python. We've got 25 years, number of theoretical simulations, 10,000. So we're going to sample from our distribution of our returns from our manager. And we're going to actually check something. We're going to check for the cases where the returns were less than minus one. So AKA, we actually lost all our money in one year because of this aggressive left-hand side tail with our portfolio manager. And lo and behold, this actually happened three times, but it was three times out of 10,000 random uh, simulations. So picture... Uh, 10,000 people, um, all, all in consecutive things, and we had a portfolio manager with the exact same distribution. Only three times out of those 10,000 did someone lose all their money um, in one year, which would have been a shame. You wouldn't make it to the end of your retirement at 50,000 with anything. So this happens because the max return in a single year was 37, but the, the minimum single uh, return in a single year was minus uh, 113, which obviously can't happen, means your account drained to zero. Now, 
for all those samples where we actually had a continuation and we made it to the end of the holding period, let's take the accumulation, the summation over those paths. So we're gonna take the log returns because we can sum the log returns to actually get the total return over the 25 years. We've made a video on that before, please check our channel out. So the plot of final histogram of the returns at 50 years of age are like here. So what we've got, we've got the Monte Carlo mean estimate is 164% uh, returns over 25 year period and our standard error is just 2%. And that's to the 95 percentile. So we're using standard error and we're using the critical value of 1.96 because that's what the, T, the uh, critical values are for the standard normal distribution for the 95 percentile. Now we have a video on our channel that goes more into Monte Carlo simulations and to understand this a little bit more, I recommend checking out one of those videos. Now, for the sole purpose here, we can see that this is not one number. So if we had just used the Sharpe ratio as per our data frame that we'd ordered on before, and then we used that and we assumed that that value was going to hold true over our investment period of 25 years, then we would have ended up with one number and we would have said, hey, look, everything's good, we're positive. But look here, we've used a Monte Carlo simulation and we've understood that there is risk that at the end of 25 years, I might be the person that's here in the bar chart and have lost my money completely compared to, yeah, I might also be very, very lucky. I might be the person who's benefited completely. And it's important to remember that this is with the true distribution of a manager who has the exact same distribution. So this is all the possible outcomes that could happen if I'm investing in the one fund. Now let's understand what happens if we change the holding time. So let's consider what happens if we reduce our holding time from 25 years down to one year, two years, five years, 10 years, and then we're going to make a ridiculous claim where we actually go up to 10,000 years. So obviously this is a bit ridiculous example, but it's just showing you the power of the central limit theorem. So if all these simulations came from the portfolio manager with those returns that we saw before, what would that look like? As you can see by looking at the results from the one year, the two year, the five year, we've got this really long left-hand tail, right? With this skewed to the right side distribution. Now this is looking very similar to the actual true distribution of the portfolio return. And this is no coincidence. So essentially what we're doing is we've realized one year here, what, what, what is our portfolio in the one year and what's the outcome? And this should nearly exactly follow the distribution of the portfolio manager. In the second year, we're realizing a, a year, so getting a certain percentage return, and then we're simulating again and adding that number. And we're doing that again and again and again for up to 10,000 years. And what you can see at the 10,000 years, we're very, very likely to have our 8% return, which is around the mean. And then we're very, very confident about that. You can see how the standard error around this Monte Carlo simulation actually is really, really insignificant. So if we could live for 10,000 years with this portfolio manager and he didn't change his strategy, year on year on year, we would be very likely to get our 8% return. If we only hold for one year, we have a huge variance in our likely outcomes, all the way down from losing our money completely um, through to getting an outrageous return. And as you increase the years, this distribution gets closer and closer to the normal distribution. So this is just one of the best examples that I can show you of what is the central limit theorem and what are we assuming when we do it in finance for our returns. Now, in the real world, we can't live for 10,000 uh, lives over over that 25 times, yes. So you might be the guy that in the one year scenario, you're all the way down here, or you might be the person down here. You don't get to choose that part. You also can't live for a thousand, 10,000 years, which is a bit sad, but we can't assume that we're going to get 8% returns with this level of accuracy. 
Unfortunately or fortunately, we only end up living one life and therefore we end up as one of these histogram bars at a particular point in the future. Therefore, given the data we have right now on the fund, what inference can we make about the returns and one of the options that's available to us and what most people assume and jump to immediately is using the maximum likelihood estimator and they trust in the central limit theorem, even if the fund's only been around for two years and has limited data. I've put something together here about the maximum likelihood estimator function. You don't need to read it all. Um, I'll just briefly explain it here. Essentially what you're trying to do, we're assuming a distribution and we're getting data and we want to, given the observed data, find what the parameters of that distribution are that yield the highest joint probability for that data set. So we're assuming the normal distribution here and we're asking what's the mean and standard deviation that would give me the highest joint probability of observing the data that I've got. Now, um, to do that, you need the probability density function. Here's the one for the normal distribution. And then you take the joint probability function of observing that data. So for my likelihood parameters, I've got my mu and my uh, variance term there. But what is the joint probability of my observed data um, as a function of these statistical parameters? And then using this data, essentially we can do a maximization function and we don't do it directly on the likelihood function because this can lead to arithmetic underflow problem, which is just we're trying to hold in memory on the computer really small numbers. Instead, this is done indirectly on the log of the likelihood function. So it's just simply a maximization problem trying to um, assign what values would be most likely to be observed in the joint probability distribution given this data here. Really, at the end of the day for the normal distribution, someone's done the hard job for you, they've gone through the math and they've come up with these uh, factors here. So our best estimate given the data is um, the mean, the estimate mean is essentially the average of the returns and the biased uh, estimator here of variance is equal to the standard deviation, the biased estimator. So it's important assumption here is that all samples of this distribution are assumed to be IID and come from the underlying normal distribution, which we've already established is an okay assumption as we have data that's going to infinity. So let's now use, use those formulas and do what we did right at the top. We've got 25 years um, that we're holding for. We've got our true distribution of our uh, investment portfolio manager. And now I want to plot only one lifetime. I'm only going to live from 25, hopefully make it to 50 once. So what was my results? I've run that simulation. I've lived once for 25 years. And at the end of the day, my Sharpe ratio was 0.57. But our actual mu was is estimated by that process of 9% with a standard deviation, standard error uh, of 16%. Um, 16%. So we, it's very, very hard if we're actually receiving data from a uh, random variable process and trying to actually understand what the distribution of returns are, especially with a low number of time periods. So essentially what we've realized though is that by doing this, uh, this MLE estimation, assuming the normal distribution, we only ever end up with one point estimate of the data, our sharp ratio, we don't understand the uncertainty around this number. So although we might get estimates back like the standard error around our um, mean estimate of the distribution, we don't understand what our worst case scenario is or our best case scenario with this single point value of the Sharpe ratio. So in following videos, we're going to talk about this more and then how we can actually uh, use different principles, use different modeling to actually get a better estimate and a better understanding of the risks involved when we're actually trying to assume what the distributions are of portfolio management returns. So thank you very much for listening. I've put all the code and this into a article in Medium. So please check it down in the description below for a link to that. Until next time, YouTube, see you later.